We're, we're going from uh, going deep into the gospel to going deep into the character of God. Um, I believe that once the gospel takes root in our life, once we've been changed by the gospel, the, the next thing, the, most, the thing that I believe uh, in a, from a physical sense that sustains our spirituality is our time in the Word of God. And uh, there, we, we are living in a day where in um, every church there is a high level of biblical illiteracy. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that. Um, I, I can look at from my own life growing up to to through my kids. And I remember um, I, I served on staff at Calvary Baptist, where I'm a member at on the West Bank, when Michael Corney, the pastor, first got there, and we kind of revamped, similar to what you guys have done here with your kids ministry. We did the same thing at Calvary. And after going through about six, eight months of the new curriculum, new direction, and stuff, I began to do an evaluation of everything and. I sat down with Michael one day, and I said, Michael, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, does your oldest son, Ethan, does he know as much scripture and as much Bible narrative as you did the same age? Michael, like me, grew up in a traditional Southern Baptist church, a traditional Sunday school, and all that kind of stuff. And he paused for a second, and he thought about it, and he looked at me and said, no, he doesn't. And it got me thinking, you know, as cool and creative as we want things to be, we want a, a, an environment that's engaging for families and for, for kids. The primary purpose is not to have an engaging and, 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 and exciting and fun environment. Our primary purpose is to teach the Bible. And so we had to go through and make a change and kind of revamp what the curriculum we were using to make sure we were actually teaching Bible narrative. When I was a youth pastor in North Louisiana, we saw an incredible amount of growth in our ministry, and what I began to realize, it was growth of kids who had never been to church. And so when I would, they had, the, you know, the surface level uh, understanding of who David and Goliath were and that kind of stuff. We spent 10 weeks just going through the Old Testament Bible narratives and gospel narratives just because they were unfamiliar with those things and, and the, the theological implications of them. So what, what I want to begin with is a question, how do you get to know someone? You know, when you when you found your wife, or if you're not married, you're in this date, dating season, and you're looking for someone, how do you get to know them? You spend time with them, right? Uh, you go on dates, you hang out, you do all these things to get to know them, to try to figure out and find out who the real person is. And you do so by just the amount of time. The more time you spend, the more you get to know that person. Uh, those of us who are married, we understand that uh, marriage uh, is an interesting animal in that uh, you think you know someone, but then you realize that as you get older and as the dynamics of life change, you change and they change. You almost have to kind of relearn each other every so many years or after every so many different uh, experiences in life. Uh, my wife and I are not the same people we were 19 years ago when we got married. Um, obviously, life changes. You know, kids come into the picture. Uh, she was in a traumatic accident about 10 years ago. The last 10 years of our life together, we have had to relearn each other probably about six or seven different times. And that's still true today. Um, but it's spending time with one another, getting to know one another, and, and understanding their character and, and who they are. The longer you're with someone, the better you understand them. Um, I've always uh, talked about with, with my interns, I said the longer you serve somewhere and serve under someone, you can kind of begin to anticipate what they want to do before they even tell you. Or if they're not there, you can, um, you can know what to do without being given direction as to what to do. And so for us, what does it mean to, to know the character of God? Is that even something we can do? The answer is yes. We can know the character of God because God allows us to know his character through the Bible. God allowed his word to be preserved over all of these years through all the various wars and everything else to be given to us today as a guide uh, for us to, to handle. But, but so many people are scared of the Bible. Uh, last year at UNO, uh, for those of you who don't know what I do, um, I oversee the, the BCM, the Baptist Collegiate Ministry here in the city. Vintage is a very um, faithful and generous partner in that ministry on a lot of different levels. And, um, and so... Uh, so at UNO last year, I began to uh, have our interns do surveys, which we, do, we actually do a lot, but added a new question. If you could sit down with someone and in a small group of two or three and just read the Bible through the semester, read the book of John, would that be something you'd be interested in? 
not a per se Bible study, but just sit down and just read the Bible and have someone there who can answer some questions. I don't know how many students they surveyed, but over almost 100 students said, yes, I would, I would like to do that. There is a desire for God's word out there, but there's also an intimidation of God's word. People are intimidated by it. Maybe because they, they may have grown up in church, but they really didn't learn anything. Um, it could be that they were given a Bible at some point, graduation, confirmation, whatever, and it's been in the same place that it was when they put it up. Um, it could be that, you know, for the longest time, a lot of folks, the only Bible they had was a King James. And if you're a King James person, this is not uh, a bash on you. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's an intimidating text, style of text to read. And so they don't realize that there are other good, solid uh, in, um, translations that can be used uh, to read. So there's lots of reasons why. But what I want to focus on is for the men in this room I want to show you how you can truly spend time with God every day. And, and a technique at the end that I'm going to talk about that you're going to uh, work on in your group time. So um, if we truly want to get to know the character of God, then we have to become men who study his word daily. Daily. What? Daily? Yes, daily. You eat every day. Why don't you feed yourself spiritually every day? Now, again, some, again that's, that's another one of those intimidation things. Well, okay, well, Corey, are you saying like daily, like maybe like the way you and the pastors here at Vintage would do daily where you have your Bible and these books and maybe you're reading out of the Greek or the Hebrew? Uh, no, no. I mean, some of us may do that. But just spending time in God's Word. There are a lot more, understand this, there are a lot more of you in the world than there are us. A lot more lay folks who love Jesus, who have been committed, who are committed to the gospel, who need to hear from God every day. There are a lot more of you than there are us. So it's not like that we as pastors have this uh, kind of this, this thing on, on studying God's word and the rest of you don't. Um, you do. You have the same Holy Spirit living inside of you. And so you can do that daily. Uh, God has made the ability to know him so easy and so accessible through the Bible. That's, that's what he's given us. And so let me give you some Bible facts to begin with. Some of these you may know, some of these may be new to you. Uh, there are 66 individual books separated into two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. You'd be surprised how many folks don't, don't know that. They know there's an old and new, but they have no idea how many books or anything. Uh, five basic genres of literature contained in the Bible. There's law, narrative, poetry, prophecy, and letters. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, and Greek. Um, it was written on three continents, Asia. Africa, and Europe. Uh, it was written by 40 different authors, most of which never met one another. Um, the authors of the Bibles wrote over a period of 1,600 years. There's at least 64 verses throughout the Bible that speak to its importance as being God's word for us. So what we're going to do is, unlike last session and the next session where I just opened up one passage of Scripture, and we kind of dug through it. This is going to be more what we call a topical message, where I'm going to give you different points and then a Scripture to go with it. Because I want you to see what God's Word says about itself for us. And we're not going to go through all 64 of these verses, just a handful that I picked out that I want you to kind of have a grasp about the importance of God's Word. So the first one is this, that all Scripture has a purpose. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. God's Word has so many purposes for us that no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, God's Word has a place and a purpose, and it can speak to you. I remember uh, growing up um, in, in Bible Belt, USA, one of the things that... Uh, my mom did because I was hyperactive and she wanted me out of the house was she signed me up for every VBS in town. Okay. All right. Now, in some ways I enjoyed it because that was free cookies and Kool-Aid every day. I mean, not a bad gig. This is when all the VBSs were during the day. 
Okay, there was the night VBS thing hadn't become a thing yet. So from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. every day, almost every week of the summer, uh, I was at some Baptist church in town, big or small. They were all really small, my little town. But anyway, big or small, having VBS. So it finally gets to my church, the church we're members at, and that's kind of like in mid-July. Now here's the thing is that today, if Vintage Church wanted to use the Lifeway curriculum, they could, but they also could pick from any other number of VBS curriculums that are doctrinally sound, that are fun and creative for kids. That was not the case growing up in the 80s. You had, but then the Baptist bookstore, or Baptist, it was what in Lifeway, it was something else. But anyway, uh, that's what you had to choose from if you were a part of a Southern Baptist church. So guess what? Every week I heard the same VBS stories, made the same VBS crafts. And so by the time it got to my church, I was kind of burned out. I was even getting a little bit burned out on cookies and Kool-Aid, to be honest with you. And um, I remember my aunt was my teacher, and uh, my aunt and I have a very much a love-hate relationship with one another. We were both type A uh, people and are very dominant. And um, so I remember just kind of losing it on the way to Bible study class. Look, I don't want to go. I already know. I can tell you what the story is. And I just rattled off whatever the story was that day. I remember my aunt pulling me aside, maybe violently pulling me aside, <laughs> and to a side room and her looking at me and saying, you never know what God wants to teach you through his word. There may be something new that is going to come out of what he, the Bible said. You may know the story, but you don't know what God's story is for you. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and really it didn't click then, but it clicks now that I can, you know, you can read through the Bible and depending on what your life is today, it teaches you one thing. You go back to the same passage six months from now, a year from now, and it could teach you something totally different. It's not that the interpretation changes, but the application of how we take the interpretation can change depending on our context. So scripture has lots of purposes for us. Number two, God's word gives us hope. God's word gives us hope. For whatever was written, Romans 15 and 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Have you ever had those days where, man, your, your life's a wreck and you get prompted to open up your Bible, maybe in the quietness of your home or your office, maybe in church, maybe in one of your V group communities, and all of a sudden what you read just really just grabs a hold of your heart and lets you know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God's word gives us hope. God gave us the gospel so that we could have hope. And so part of his character is this hope that he gives us, that the trials that we endure on this earth is not the end, that the struggles that we go through do not define us. The gospel defines us. The gospel dictates who we are. Number three, God's word is is always relevant. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Oh, Corey, the Bible, man, gosh, that's such an old book. Gosh, it was written on, not, it wasn't even written in the United States. It wasn't even written in America. I mean, you know, <laughs> how in the world, how in the world can this, can this be relevant to me, this, you know, 21st century, New Orleans living, big easy life, what, what, gosh, from page to, from cover to cover, even the maps are still relevant, right? It's relevant to us because it speaks to our heart. It's a living word. It's an active word. It's one that penetrates our hearts. It's one that, that, that is, a, it gives us, it's the guidance that we need. And so it doesn't matter that it was written thousands of years ago. What's important is that God allowed these specific texts to persevere and to be preserved because he has anointed these, that for those of us who are in Christ, who have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, as we read these texts, they're very, very relevant. I was um, in a situation where I had two churches who were interested in me coming on staff. I had just gotten married and um, got a call from one of them saying, hey, listen, we need to have an answer from you by tomorrow, or we need to move on to a new candidate. Okay, that's fair. Man, it was like 1A, 1B. I'm going through these opportunities and stuff, and it's like one is to go to this church that is really 
uh, in a cool area off of a military base, a lot of cool things going. I was going to be their first ever full-time youth pastor. And then I had this other church to go and work on staff with the pastor I grew up under. He had left our church, and it was at this other church. And, I mean, in the flesh, this was the easy choice because this is the guy I knew, and I knew he would work me like a dog, but I knew I knew him and, and saved under his ministry, all this stuff. But it was this other church who called and said, hey, we need an answer. And so I knew that I had to focus my attention right here to see what God wanted me to do. So I got up in the morning, prepared to go do my quiet time, and could not find my Bible. No idea. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment. How do you lose a Bible in a one-bedroom apartment? I mean, you know, um, and so I search around. I can't find it. So finally, I grabbed my wife's devotion book. And I'm not a big devotion book person. If you are, that's fine. Uh, that's just not, just never been my thing. But I, So I grabbed her devotion book. I sit down the park branch, and guys, if I'm, I'm lying, I'm dying, I opened it up to that day, and the verses there says, go, and I will give you rest. All right, Lord, it's pretty clear. Um, and so I did. I, I, I called the pastor after I got done spending time with the Lord. I said, listen, I, the Lord, I'm coming. Let's go. Let's do this. Um, my pastor that grew up in was a little disappointed, but, I mean, you know, God was pretty clear with that. It was relevant to that time. Um, God's word reads us while we read it. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we don't just read it like we read a novel. It reads us. It looks into our heart, it looks into our soul, and what does it do? It shows us the things that are not of God in our life, so that we can repent of those things. It cuts to the deep. It's not surface level, man. This is like, this is intense heart surgery. Every time we get into God's word, it both makes us feel good and also brings conviction. And we talked about how, you know, people, quote unquote, walk away from the faith. Well, really, they don't. That's one of the things that I, I think is another mark is that the idea of conviction, they're convicted over their sin and they don't want to, they don't want to do anything with it. And they're like, you know what, this is, this, I'm, I'm I'm moving on. Again, it's superficial. But those of us who have a deep root in the gospel, that conviction, though sometimes it may take us a little time to deal with it, we're not running away from it. We're just wrestling with it. But the conviction's a good thing. Just like when you go to the doctor and they say, hey, this is wrong and here's a remedy to fix it. For two years, I, 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 I didn't take care of a of a hernia that I had. Just watched it continue to grow in my stomach. I made the joke that it was my one pack because it looked like I had one ab just kind of sticking out right there. I was kind of proud of that. It was, it was the only pack I ever had in my life. But finally, after two years, I went and saw a different surgeon because I've had this surgery now three times. And she looked at it and she said, we got, we got to take care of this. But I, I know it's not bothering you medically. It's not harming you, but it's going to cause problems in the future if you don't address it. And I had to come to realize, okay, I have to submit to that. And I've got to get it fixed. And the same thing, whenever we read Scripture, it reads us, and it says, here's the problem with you. Here's where, here's where you need to grow. Here's, here's where you need to trust me more. Go ahead and deal with that. Um, the Bible was written by men, but its content was given by God. All right, the Bible was written by men, but its content was given by God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So as we read the scriptures, understand we are reading things that were written by men, okay? Uh, at that time, if you were living at that time, God could have used you to write some of this stuff. But what was written was inspired by the Holy Spirit directly from God. And so it's authoritative in our lives. Um, God's Word gives us guidance in both the short and long terms. Both the short and long terms. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. One of the first verses that you learn, if again, going back to VBS, that you learn at VBS, you know, when you do a little pledge to the Bible, which, you know, I think is a little silly now growing up, but um, I think I still remember it. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and it'll make it a lamp to my feet and a light into my path and hide its word in my heart that I might sin against God. All right, there's good doctrine in there, right? <laughs> But we don't pledge allegiance to the Bible, per se. I mean, we, you know, we, we trust it. We, we're under its authority, but anyway. Um, 
But, that, but this verse is in there. That's what made me think of that. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. When I think lamp unto my feet, I think that's in the short term. Think about carrying a lamp and what's happening. It's dark, and so you want to make sure you don't do what? Stub your toe on something, right? So I get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, and you forget where your bed, the corner of your bed is until your toe hits it. <laughs> then, you're, then you're having to repent of things you said. All right? You know, it happens. So God's word gives us the short term, but it's also a light into our path. And so it also gives us direction to the long term. Now, what we would love for the Bible to do, what we love for God to do, is to kind of sometimes reveal our future, right? Like, hey, God, can you just go ahead, instead of just giving me a light, show me that there is a path ahead and that I'm on the right path, can you just illuminate the path? Can you just like shine spotlights there so that, that I can see what my future has? And God doesn't do that. He provides for us what we need when we need it. And I think that sometimes is he doesn't illuminate our future for two reasons. One, if there's a blessing ahead, he doesn't want us to become prideful now. You know, if we see that there's something great in our future, it may cause us to become prideful now. Like, hey, look, look what's coming up ahead. That's awesome. Man, look at me. But he also doesn't light it up just in case there's a storm ahead as well. That would be like, no, 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 God, I, um, I'm going to, like in the GPS when the road's blocked, let's find an alternate route. It, let's, let's go this way. God's like, no, 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 I want you this way. But, but God, there's, there's that there, and I don't want to go there. So let's go here. Even if it's the long way around, I'm okay. And God's like, no, 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 I, I'm with you. I'm going with you. So he lights up. His word lights us up both in the short and in the long term. Uh, God's word is more than just words. It's a person. In Jesus Christ, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son from, from the father, full of grace and truth. You know, it's, um, it's one thing to have a book that guides us. And we're grateful for that. We submit to its authority, but its authority is from God because it is God. Now, the Bible is not God. We don't worship the Bible, okay? But we stand under the authority of God's word in our lives, because we recognize that the word that was given was from God himself, and it's through Jesus. The word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. That's always my favorite Christmas verse, that he dwelt among us. God, God decided to hang out with us. You know, this is kind of a side note. The one thing that makes biblical Christianity different than all other world religions is that all the world religions try to tell you, try to tell you how to get to God. Biblical Christianity, and I, and I use the word biblical Christianity for a reason because there's a lot of Christianity out there that does not believe the way the Bible teaches of what Jesus did. But biblical Christianity says, no, no, you can't get to God, so God came to you. And he dwelt among you. Awesome, awesome idea. God's word is a buffer against sinning. Psalm 119, 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might sin against God. Uh, another area in our, in our churches that we have, uh, we're lacking in is scripture memorization. You know, it was, again, back to the traditional Sunday school days. If those of you who grew up in this environment, you know this. There was usually some kind of like little board in your Sunday school room that had everybody's name. And there was the dates for that quarter. And there were little stars that you would get if you memorized your memory verse every week. Some of you guys are smiling. You remember that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and if you were like, if your church was like my church, if your Sunday school teacher was like my Sunday school teacher, like whoever had the most stars got a prize. And, uh, I remember, uh, there were uh, lots of my teachers had that, but one in, my, in middle school, they owned a mom and pop sports store in town. And, uh, they were offering a $20 gift certificate to their store for the person with the most verses. And, uh, you know, I went in their store one day and I saw what I wanted. Like, this is when the new era hats first came out, that you could actually wear the same hats as the, the pros. And they were 20 bucks, which back then, that was a lot of money for a hat. All right, now, I mean, that's, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm like, that was my motivation because I'm a New York Mets fan. You don't find much Mets gear in Eunice, Louisiana. It's just like, you know, it's just not there. And so, but they had, they had Mets New Era hats. And I'm like, Dude, I will memorize the entire Bible if I have to, <laughs> to get that gift certificate. Because my mom was not, my mom and dad were not going to pay 20 bucks for a cap. But I'm going to get that gift certificate. And I did. And I got my Mets hat and I was the happiest kid in Eunice. <laughs> All that to say is that having God's word in our heart, there's a, there's a value to that. Now, 
it used to be that I could make the case, well, hey, you don't always have your Bible on you. But now when I make that case, like, oh, <laughs> my phone. But can I tell you that there's times that it's easier for me to find a verse in here than it is on my phone. Now, granted, Google does help a lot. But using your Bible app, kind of like, oh, where's that at? I don't know. Um, but here, if it's, if it's in my head, it's in my heart. And here's another thing. I can preach the scripture to myself. If it's in my head, then the Holy Spirit can bring it to, to, to my memory, to the front of my memory, whenever I'm in an attempting situation. When I need to preach the gospel to myself and I don't have a Bible in front of me, or I don't have a pastor in front of me, the Holy Spirit can illuminate it. Um, there was a young lady who came to my office at Tulane, and we sat down and began to talk about the gospel. And um, I, I say this not in a prideful way, but just to give you an example of how the importance of Scripture memory is. My Bible was laying, was sitting on my desk. It was closed, and I'm looking at it, and I, and I was able to have the whole conversation. And I, I probably quoted 10 or 12 different Scriptures, and I never had to break open my Bible. I was able to keep eye contact with her the whole time as we talked about these things. It's important. There's sometimes you may be in a situation at work or somewhere else where you don't have your Bible with you or your app. You just don't want to pull your app out, but you can, you can share the gospel and you can use scripture. So I, I commend to you to, to try to find some kind of scripture memory process. There may be a resource here at the church that can help you with that. You can talk with one of the pastors about that. Um, let's go real quick. We're almost done. Uh, God's word is truth. Uh, John 17, 17. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Um, God's word is something that should be part of your life every day. Psalm 1, 1 through 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Lord, law of the Lord, and on, and on his law he meditates day and night. Man, spending time in God's word every day, letting it marinate. I love to cook. I love to grill. I love to smoke meat. Okay, um, I love cooking ribs. Okay, I will marinate and rub and put the rub of my ribs a full 24 hours before I cook them. Why? Because when I pull them out, I want all that seasoning, all that dry rub, not just to be a surface, but to have penetrated inside of those ribs. It just gives it incredible, incredible flavor. Uh, I did some yesterday. They were amazing. All right. All this to say, all this to say, how do we do it? Like, how do I read God's word? How do, I, how do I take what I read and, and, and cause it to become something that I can really apply? So what I'm about to teach you is not mine. I wish it was. If, not, if it was, I would, have, I would have written this book, and uh, not Robbie Gallaty, and I would have been making a profit off of it. Um, this is a resource that is in your resource center. Actually, there's two of them I'm going to show you. Uh, the, the Hear Journal method I'm going to teach you, some of you may know it. Some of you may not. It's in chapter 10 of this book. This book is required reading for all of my staff who work with me. Um, and so I recommend that if you have a few bucks, I don't know how much the church is selling these for, um, but if you have a few bucks, this is a great read. It, it outlines how discipleship groups are done. And, but in particular, chapter 10 is, is the one about the HEAR Journal. So let's talk about a HEAR Journal. What is the, a HEAR Journal? And basically, HEAR is an acronym. So hearing God while reading the Bible, the letter H is highlight a verse or verses that stuck out to you or made an impression on you. When you read a passage of Scripture and you're looking for God to speak, He does. And usually what happens, if you have those moments where you're reading God's Word and something just pops out to you, like there's something that's going to, there's a verse or a couple verses that just hit you in the face and you, you don't know what to do with them sometimes. This is what you should highlight. This is the Holy Spirit illuminating God's word for you, giving you some kind of direction, okay? And so the H is for highlight. Next is the E. The E is for explain. Explain what that verse or those verses mean in context. This is important, okay? Because so often people pull out verses that they like, but they're not in context, okay? There are, there are, there are Christian denominations that build part of their theology on cool verses that are out of context. It's true. All right? The reality of it is, is that to understand God's word you've, today, to apply it well today, you have to understand its original context. That's why it frustrates me and a lot of people when you see 
people, and I'll just use politicians just in general, quoting the Bible because the vast majority of them quote it out of context, whether on the right or the left. All right, it's frustrating as all get out. Um, the, the amount of uh, pandering to the quote unquote church that politicians do by trying to quote scripture when it's quoted out of context. So it's important that we understand this verse. So how do I do that? Well, I have to understand what's, what I read maybe before or what I'm reading after. Maybe I, depending on where it fits in the chapter, I may have to go to the previous chapter, the chapter right after. Do I understand the context of the entire letter or book? All these things are important in understanding exactly what uh, God is saying here. All right, let's go to the next one. A is for apply. Apply what you read to your life. Okay, so God has given me this verse today. I understand it in context. Now, how do I apply that to my life? Okay, how do I apply that to my life? How do I take this truth or these truths that are taught in this, these passages and apply those to my life? And then last of all, respond. Respond to God about what he's shown you in his word. Now, for me, when I do responses, when I do my hair journals, responses are a prayer. Dear God, help me to do, in light of this, help me to do this, basically. And so, for me, that's what I do. Now, you, your response can be whatever you want it to be. For me, it's a prayer. All right, and so, so this, since I've been introduced to this method, um, this is my go-to. This is what I teach our college students. When, uh, one of the first sermons I do at the beginning of each school year now is, Reading God's Word. Basically, this sermon just kind of rearranged a little bit, but at the end, I'm, we're doing the same thing. Same thing I have our college students that you're going to do. I give them this information, and I say, okay, let's practice. So we're going to practice. Now, let me tell you, uh, I do this with my kids, and uh, it's, it's always interesting, especially the highlight, because my son, my son is very, very ADD. All right, and so when I, when I taught them, okay, as you read this passage, find something that just sticks out to you. Okay, don't ever tell at that time a 13-year-old ADD kid, just whatever sticks out to you, that's your highlight verse. Because we're sitting around at family worship one night, and our family worship is just going through the week's hair journals. Like, we don't sing, because I can't. none of us in our family can sing. So um, we just worship through God's Word and uh, in prayer. And so it gets to my son on one of these, and it's like, so-and-so walked... 5,000 miles, some just ridiculous, just non-spiritually important verse in the scripture. I'm like, what's your explain on that? He had to walk a long distance. <laughs> okay? How, how does that apply to your life? I hope I don't have to walk. <laughs> what's your response? God, please don't make... And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, this whole pastoring your family. I'm such a loser. <laughs> give me college students. Give me a, anybody but my three children, okay? I will be happy to pastor them. Um, anyway, so keep that in mind that it may be unique that you have to walk 5,000 miles. That's probably not, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to limit the Holy Spirit, but anyway. All right, so here's what you're going to have in your on your notes. You're going to have a passage, and I, I picked, I usually use Philippians chapter 4. And usually everybody picks verse 13, and they usually get it out of context, and I get to teach them the context of it. All right, by the way, if, you, if Philippians 4.13 is your life verse, uh, it is not a blank check that God's going to do everything you want for you. Just I hate to burst your bubble, but it's not. Uh, so I picked another one that's pretty fun, which is John chapter 3. Uh, so I want you to read John chapter 3. I think I provided it for you in your notes. If not, if you have a Bible there, you can use it. And then I want you to use the, the hear journal method. I want you to, what stuck out to you? What, how, what's the highlight verse or verses? Uh, and, and if it's John 3, 16, that's fine. Uh, I, I picked for a reason. Uh, I want you to explain it in context. Apply to your life and respond. Uh, when you get done, I want you to kind of talk among yourselves uh, about what God showed you. And then I'm going to uh, come back up here in about 20 minutes or so and, uh, and ask a couple of our tables to share uh, briefly what uh, what God taught them, and I'm going to point you to a resource, another resource you have here at the church.